Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. I'm Shane Northrup, mixer and producer here at GSMC, and we are bringing you the best of the television podcast. Now, I don't know if some of you have been seeing it there on your Facebook, uh, always wanting to try to incite a panic on social media. Of course, all of you know that every month, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is going to start charging you for Facebook premium. But, hey, if you post whatever your friend shared on your wall, then uh, they will know that you don't give them permission to charge you. And there will be free versions of Facebook if you post some ridiculous thing as your profile picture. Every month, a couple of my dumb friends post that. Or that just to be safe, and then they share, and it's dumb. But another thing that just came out here recently uh, in widespread panic is there was a Supreme Court ruling uh, regarding the use of a password that, based on the ruling, immediately kicked up a stir about if using this password that is not yours uh, being a federal crime, then... Anybody that shares their Netflix account or HBO Go or whatever with a friend or a family member, whenever that person's using your account is committing a federal crime. And it was all over the place. It was it was shared thousands, if not millions of times. Like, hey, be on the lookout because if you share your Netflix password, then you're going to jail. And I just want to let everybody know it's not true. Okay? But – Put down the gun. Just put it down, man. Nothing's going to happen to you if you share your Netflix password. And by the way, I want to keep this because until I get HBO now, I need my dad uh, every year to give me his HBO Go information so I can watch Game of Thrones. But that's not what that's not what the Supreme Court's ruling was worried, was uh, concerning. And honestly, I'm surprised that it even came to Supreme Court because uh, what they're ruling on is actually a form of fraud. So somebody had lost credentials at their job and then use someone else's login information uh, to maintain uh, or, or attempting to uh, defraud or corrupt that thing. That's a crime, which I was like, yeah, because that, that is a form of fraud, which is already a crime. But in that case, it was using someone else's password um, to, to commit bad deeds. And in, and in the statement, or anything involving the case, all these things like um, account-based stuff for media consumption, never mentioned. So Netflix is never mentioned. And this thing, the summary was like 60-something pages long. So it it doesn't count towards uh, your media accounts. So please, uh, I'm begging you, stop sharing the BS posts stop making it seem like this is another thing about corporate reach and all that other stuff. It's the Supreme Court's ruling is not related to that. So you can share away for now until until they decide to actually appeal that and find some other kind of crazy thing to make it so it's not. But right now it's fine. You're okay to proceed <laughs> as you were. In allowing your grandma that one account on Netflix. So it's okay. 
and how uh, this stuff is bound to happen. And and it's 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 not surprising this come up now. It's a false alarm right now, but as as the media consumption coming through the internet and streaming and using these services become more and more popular, we're going to see contention and pushback from the providers. And I go back and I think of when you look at stuff like remember the thing of the ride share applications we're talking uber uh lyft um those those types of applications now uber hadn't really gotten i mean when uber came out it, there was these levels of use you can have but i mean it was straight up gonna be like a taxi service they had already it was a show for service they were gonna do but when lyft first came out it was considered a ride share which they did not obligate you to pay it was a suggested donation. A lot of the original rideshare ones were donation based as if you were like, oh, thanks, buddy. Here's some money for gas. Now, Lyft, Lyft actually said like, hey, we suggest that you donate this much. And then another company didn't have anything. I mean, it was, it was all based on how much you wanted to pay that allowed to do that. But enough litigation came down and enough red tape – um, from the man about these sort of practices left towards you no know, now now that it grows and we have to be considered for this we have to be considered this type of service therefore we have to charge per mile we have to do this we have to offer this and for a while on here like you couldn't lifts and stuff weren't allowed at the airport it was only uh, allowed for taxis so they had to become more and more like a taxi company so the regulations for a lot of these just started to come through and then we see with um even with these streaming services, remember when Hulu first came out, we've talked about this before, fairly limited on towards the type of programming that it was offering. And then it got in the bed with more and more studios and Netflix, Netflix, man, when it first came out, it was primarily just about getting the discs and your streaming experience was very poor. I remember streaming, you can only get like, you know, sequels to bad horror movies out there. They didn't have, big name movies coming out in the streaming service. And then it became more and more popular and then they started making their own stuff and they got the big deal with Disney. And so the, the legalities and stuff, a lot of the, and, it, and it's going to continue to grow and grow and grow that. Yeah. Maybe one day we will see this like, no, um, there are limitations on devices that you can log in at and they'll monitor those and they'll they'll raise some flags and they'll like no if somebody else wants to get this then they're going to have to pay for it. Um how that will be monitored, I'm pretty sure they're developing the technology right now if it doesn't already exist. Uh we can ask the NSA, but the that's probably going to be coming down the pipe at some point at some point. So um but right now, like I said, if you see it there on Facebook, if you see it on ever the Supreme Court's ruling about the the password, uh, using someone else's password, whatever, was not related to uh, your HBO Go or your Hulu or your Amazon uh, Prime and stuff like that. Um, that's not the point to where we're at. Okay, so so please stop sharing it, stop freaking out, and and also stop sharing that stupid thing about paying for Facebook. Please, it, it, it's already been addressed years ago. Okay. It's already been done. So all my friends out there, all my family, never post that stupid junk again. Please. Um Kevin Smith, huge comic book guy, is anybody that would have watched anything that he's done knows he not only has been involved in directing previous uh previous episode of The Flash, from last season, which would have been considered by many to be the most emotionally moving, where he sees his mom again, sort of the um, – what's it called? Like the the attack of the dinosaurs? I don't remember the episode. I don't remember episode names to save my life. But uh, he directed an episode of The Flash. He will be coming back in season three, which uh, for those that have, have been – uh, on different websites, which they've been hinting at is something called Flashpoint. If you don't know what Flashpoint is, 
you can check out the DC animated film on Netflix right now. It'll give you a rough idea as to what's going on with that because the premise starts out the exact same way that season three ended where Barry goes back in time and stops his mother's murder. Now there's going to be a sort of uh, time travel repercussions involved with that. And you can check that out. Like I said, and kind of see where they're going to go. Obviously they're going to have to do some tweaks because I highly doubt with what Gotham being on the air right now, they will not be able to infuse the Thomas Wayne story line into it, but it is possible they could do that with Arrow. Now, the, the whole concept of doing Flashpoint is very interesting because, because Flash interplays with Supergirl and will be interplaying with Arrow, this one show has taken on to do something uh, fairly monumental as far as... Uh, the way a TV is going to go as far as the through line in seasons is how will that affect the other shows? How is this going to affect Arrow? If they put Ollie Queen in the Bruce Wayne spot to where Oliver Queen had died and his father lived on and got off the island and he became Arrow, well, what are you going to do with Stephen Amell? Is he just not going to be on television for a year? It's There's some questions that are going to be that have to be answered. And obviously I don't think that anybody from the CW or working there at DC haven't thought of these things and how they're going to do it. Uh, they've been, they've been do it's been gangbusters so far and now they're going to roll over Supergirl to the CW, which really is where she should have been to begin with. They're going to re air season one coming to season three. So we got Kevin Smith coming back doing presumably a flashpoint like episode. Um, we'll see really where the series is going, whether that, plot line will stick around for maybe half season and then he fixes everything we'll, we'll, we're gonna see but kevin smith returns he knows he's going to direct episode seven of the next season and with that there's been a lot of talk about him wanting to not just direct but also write an episode of arrow um as i previously mentioned kevin smith has history in comics he really reinvigorated and brought back Green Arrow and saved him from cancellation just as he did with Daredevil. Um, and one of the characters that he created by the name of Onomatopoeia, it definitely worked in the comic realm. For years he was saying he didn't want anyone to adapt it into live action because he just said it wouldn't work. But he claims that he has a way to make Onomatopoeia work in live action that would be really creepy and really cool I'm hoping that they do that. I'm hoping they bring him in, at least let him write the episode. Um, and if he gets to direct, that'd be cool. If he brought in, was able to bring into Arrow as well as doing Flash, then that would really only leave him at that point to direct one of those episodes where they cross over, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure he would love to do. Uh, he's a huge DC fan, would definitely want to work in both in, uh, in Arrow sandbox and get them all together. So... I mean, DC, CW is just moving right along, doing a lot of really cool stuff. This has been Golden State Media Concepts, best of the television podcast. Stick around for more. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be. All right, we are back on the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Uh, talking a bit here about some news that had come out just recently. Uh, the Russo brothers, who you might recognize their name as uh, becoming sort of the it guys in Hollywood for their work on the last two Captain America films, Winter Soldier and Civil War, uh, really bringing that that brand of Captain America uh, out to be bigger almost in the Avengers flicks 
and they're taking over for the next two Avengers films. But now they're looking to get into television and they're making a splash in a very big way. Uh, Just recently reported that they are going to be uh, producing, really taking charge of and running the production of a TV adaptation of The Warriors. And that may sound familiar to some out there. The Warriors, uh, a a film from the the late 1970s based off of a novel from the 1960s, which that is even an adaptation from an old uh, ancient Greek story uh, involving some soldiers that are making their way um, through Persia back to Greece. And uh, The Warriors is really, it's, it's a cult classic as far as the dystopian um, sci-fi lovers goes. The the history on that, ever since the film came out, there was a version that came out here in the last few years, sort of a director's cut. And before Tony Scott um, took his own life, God rest his soul, uh, he was attached to do a, a a remake of as a movie. Uh, but there was a whole there was a whole bunch of stuff I was reading about at the time that just really didn't uh, <laughs> sit right with me about it. Um, in the Warriors, it takes place in New York, um, in the, in the not too distant future type setting, uh, really where gangs have sort of taken over, uh, the, the protection and everything of these uh, neighborhoods. They're just, it's just run amok and very contentious, uh, relationship with the police where they sort of have, the police don't really get involved in much, but now in the story of the warriors, they want to take that, um, instead of having all these different factions, there is, uh, a guy who's wanting to unite them all. And he wants to bring all the gangs together to basically go to war with the cops and show them they don't need police protection at all. And in the story, uh, that man that's going to unite all these people gets killed and the people who kill him blame the murder on the warriors. So now the warriors who have come all the way down from Coney Island, they got to make their way back to their turf and they get in uh, some scrapes with all these other folks, um, rival gangs and stuff on their way back. So it's, it's a movie worth checking out and this adaptation, um, Obviously, because it, it's just the one – I mean it's just the one movie and the one novel, uh, the original telling of this story back in the old ancient Greek. I mean that was like seven days, but uh, – seven installments, sorry. Um, but the Russos are wanting to do this as a one-hour, um, one-hour per episode series. I, I'm – I got to believe it's going to be a miniseries. It's not going to be – um, something that'll have multiple seasons. I can't imagine, uh, cause they would, they would definitely have to expound on it a lot. I mean, it, it, unless it's going to be the, the stories of the warriors, not just that particular one taking place at that moment in time, you know, but, but further adventures afterwards, maybe they do something like that. Um, that could be interesting, but if they're going to tell this particular story that was the original film, then uh yeah that can't be something that runs <laughs> that runs more than one season i imagine it could be something um like uh 11 22 63 where there was only like eight parts it wasn't you know like a full on 10 to 12 episode run um but they wanted to make it an hour long so they're going to they're going to it's going to be a bit more they said it's going to be a bit more pulpy a bit more violent a bit more sexy as is we've come to demand from from all of our shows and it's not going to be network uh it looks like it's it's paramount pictures that's going to be producing it but it looks like they want to put it on hulu so that will be a hulu original just you know it, it, it's it's a very clear message that um, a lot of these studios are sending to uh, networks and providers that they will take the names and they will take the content um, and product and put it on a service that they know they can get a lot of views from and a lot of people are going to watch without without a CBS, without a Fox or without – you know, all these other things and without the help of any type of, uh, 
uh, uh, major studio backing as far as television goes to produce something and put it on an avenue where you don't have to have uh, a, a television subscription by cable or by satellite in order to get to you. Here we're going to get into uh, a little bit. Usually um, I would go about and I'd talk about a specific show, but I want to talk about in the realm of television, something that is exciting for all viewers. And I'm talking about children and adults alike. Okay. And that is the resurgence and explosion of animation. And I know some people may not be a fan, some of the older folks that just like, oh, cartoons are only for kids. Well, then maybe you haven't heard of this little show called The Simpsons. It was only, it's only been on for like 50 years. But the idea of things changing so much from the 1990s till now, and really I, I come from a generation that was, in my mind – uh, grown up with not only had been the most cartoons at the time, but probably some of the best. And I know it, it I'm going to seem like some Homer simply because, uh, do you see what I did there? Simpsons, Homer, whatever. Um, simply because I was born and raised in that time period, but we rule the broadcasting world now. So I'm allowed to say that those are the best Batman, the animated series. Okay. G.I. Joe, Thundercats, Darkwing Duck, Tailspin. Now, in in comparison, if you look at the television that my parents had grown up with as far as animated shows, you still have the Flintstones. You still have the, uh, the Jetsons, okay? And you had... Warner Brothers cartoons, obviously the Looney Tunes have been around even since since my grandparents were young. So those had always existed. And then there was a little bit of an explosion. You know, Scooby-Doo came out. Scooby-Doo was a big thing. Um, Josie and the Pussycats was also out there. So the animated world started to get a little bit broader, still kind of only available in just a few different places, uh, maybe on a certain day. And then when I was a kid with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Biker Mice from Mars, uh, SWAT Cats, the list goes on and on, they were available for so many hours, maybe on a specific day or a specific couple of days, or they were in prime time. You had shows like Doug. You had shows like Ren and Stimpy, which was a Nickelodeon show but more understood and be able to be understood by adults. That was one show that my dad liked to watch with us. I don't know. I just thought it was kind of crude and therefore funny. And my dad just thought it was hysterical. But the availability came out. So Nickelodeon was developed. Disney got their own channel and they had, you know, the Gummy Bears. That was one that was on there. You had stuff like the Smurfs, which is, again, of an older generation. But that was being brought forward as well. So... The availability of cartoons was just getting wider and wider, and Fox had their Saturday mornings, and CBS had their Saturday mornings, and ABC and all these other ones had these programs that would essentially you know, try to vie for that kid viewing. And then there were very limited resources as far as getting an adult, an adult type show. And then Cartoon Network came out, which – blew the world away because it was just dedicated to cartoons and that's when we saw um, animation domination so america was getting a taste of uh some anime flicks that were that had come out really like 20 years before but had just recently been dubbed over um we saw that and space ghost came back but in a different format with space ghost coast to coast and uh Cartoon Network brought it forward, and now you're looking at multiple multiple networks that are strictly dedicated to uh, cartoons and, and even throwbacks. There, Nick has one channel that just shows old Nickelodeon cartoons, and I, but I think Disney has one as well. So the angle of that, the availability has absolutely blown wide open. But that's not the thing that makes this revolution come. What makes the revolution occur 
as far as animation is concerned is how easy it is to do it. When C Lab came out, okay, or you had stuff like the Venture Brothers, right now what you're getting on uh, Netflix like BoJack Horseman or F is for Family, the the old school way of making a cartoon, which was doing the hand drawings, then sending it off to somewhere in the Pacific to get animated and colored, having to spend months and months between episodes, it was very expensive and not a lot of people could do it. But computers have brought the ability to animate characters very quickly save environments in which to animate them in the production cost has gone down so far, but the quality has been able to maintain now shows like Archer and shows like C lab and shows like, um, frisky dingo. Those ones that are really kind of that flash format though. That's primarily driven by the writing, not necessarily the aesthetic of the show, but on the other hand, not just adult shows, because I could watch Archer until the cows come home. I, I, I could do that all day, simply because of how much I love the writing. But children shows have gone that way, too. My daughter watches Sophia the First and Jake and the Neverland Pirates and Doc McStuffins and all that other stuff. But for little kids, there's stuff like Super Y, uh, a very cheaply done show. And just because it's done on the cheap, I don't mean to say that the quality is cheap. So it's becoming easier and easier and faster and faster to make cartoons. This is the new point that computers have not only allowed for films to be done better looking on a lower budget, but television as well. And television is a largely a, a, a bigger consumer audience than film. In fact, more people are going to try to watch those movies from the privacy of their own home on their TV if they want. So what we're looking at here with the explosion of animation, I, I say jump on board. It's, it's an exciting time right now for the DIY, the do it yourself and these little studios that would have otherwise had no chance to tell the story, to tell the jokes or convey the lesson. Uh, those people are getting a better opportunity now. And I think it's fantastic. This has been GSMC's best of television podcast. Stay tuned for more. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G smcpodcast.com for more info. Hey, 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 we are back. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. Now is the part of the show where I actually talk about a television series at great length. Uh, a little bit there. What I want to talk about here today... Um, uh, I first want to start off uh, by saying that I was I'm a fan of Firefly, f a fan of Serenity, uh, that whole thing. Um, a short-lived show. We all know it's a crime. The the minds that were uh, behind it, of course, uh, Joss Whedon, Tim Minear, uh very funny, very creative people. But they also got creative and funny people to be in the cast, uh, two of them being Alan Tudyk and Nathan Fillion. You know the names. Uh, Alan really, after this series uh, went off, he went off to you know co-star and some stuff, kind of doing uh, the supporting role. Well, Nathan Fillion went on to do uh, Castle, that had a good run there for a good while. But what we're looking at here uh, is th just this idea that existed in primarily Alan Tudyk's mind about the the fandom craze for Firefly that continued to follow him around, although it was only one season of a show and one movie that the character that he made and the legacy of the show, um, 
that got him going to different conventions, so sci-fi conventions, comic conventions, stuff like that, that it inspired him to create uh, basically a semi, semi-autobiographical uh, sitcom that was made and first put up on Vimeo. Um, and then it was, you can get it on Amazon prime. Now you can download the season. I think it's like a buck 99 per episode. The, the show is interesting. Number one, because of its format, an episode is 10 minutes long. So each arc, each particular arc consists of three episodes. So you get a 30 minute worth of a sitcom episode, but you have to watch it in three different portions. And this show was crowdsourced so there were no studio producers this was something that alan tudyk and nathan fillion the the producers that were only going to make it if they had complete control over it so instead of going around and going to studios and asking for money to do this and have them sort of trade off the name and trade off the brand and do everything else that they decided they were going to reach out to the fans, explain what this was, and say, hey, if you want to help be a part of this, then you know we'll gladly take your donations. Blew up. I think they, they doubled, tripled what they were looking to do, of course, because the and, – and they said they didn't expect it, but they, they had to know that the devotion of the fan base – And knowing that the premise was that this show is about a guy named Ray Nearly who he's struggling after the cancellation of his uh, of his space show. I mean, it it, is just parallel to, you know, what Firefly was. Now, obviously, I mean, Alan Tudyk wasn't hurt and he's not starving or anything, Um, but just being a sitcom about that character who who regrets and really sort of hates his fame in the form that it came from because he imagines himself as an artist and all this other stuff that, I mean, Alan Tudyk doesn't represent that. Alan Tudyk, as I said, like he's a huge geek. He loves what Firefly was. He loves the fan base um, and is really making this for, for him and for them a little bit that everybody was on board well funded the project and then they started production. So, I mean, Alan, Alan Tudyk wrote and directed the show, um, all the episodes. And just because it was, you know, a little, a little budget type thing, it still didn't stop the stars from coming out, at least the stars of the sci-fi world. So Nathan Fillion is in it. Um, his character is, he's Jack Moore. And obviously he played the captain on the show, and they're friends in the show, and you see Nathan Fillion a lot, but they're never on screen together unless it's like a portion that they show from the failed show Spectrum, because he's always going out and doing stuff because he's a big star. And um, <laughs> they got t- there's tons of weird, weird things like Casper Van Dien, who's from the original Starship Troopers. He's in the show, and he's the bartender everywhere that... Ray, that uh, that Ray ends up going. It's really weird, and they never they kind of like hint at they're like, "Why aren't you?" But but he never really talks about it. It's really fun. Um, uh, Trisha Helfer, she's been in uh, one of the I guess three episode stints. Uh, Amy Acar, uh, Henry Rollins was in it. Um, Leslie Jordan, I didn't even know the dude was still alive. He came back in it. Sean Astin, sort of like this weird this weird Yoda like character. He was great. Um, Sean Maher, also from Firefly, uh, appeared in it. Felicia Day of uh, the Guild fame, also in uh, Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog. She's in it as well. Nolan North. So you, you have a lot of the people that they're aiming. So the demographic that they know that this appeals to is that crowd, is the gamer sci-fi crowd. I'm sorry, someone through that. And that's why there's there's people like Will Wheaton's in it. I mean, Will Wheaton... Will Wheaton seemingly now is in more places than ever. They're able to bring in all of these other people that you recognize from other sci-fi brands and and including the man himself, Joss Whedon. So the the show is incredibly funny and there are some really good poignant parts, but it is it's almost like when you watch a sitcom that was developed for a stand-up comic where you have to sort of take their material 
and then expound that bit into an actual scenario where it's going to be, you know, it, where there's going to be blocking and there's going to be actors and they're basically going to be playing out that whole bit. Thank you for tuning in to the Golden State Media Concepts Best of Television podcast. I'm Shane Northrup, mixer and producer here at GSMC, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Stitcher, SoundCloud, gsmcpodcast.com, and iTunes. Thank you for listening.